Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming, giving up your busy lives and your busy times to come and join us here today. Um, hopefully, you're at the right event. Uh, we're having a, a social value forum. And um, part of the reason that we're here today, and uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, my name is Carl Belazer. I'm a director of uh, a 22 year old development agency called Social Enterprise Works. Uh, we've been helping support to organizations create social value for over 20 years. However, this event follows the recent adoption of Bristol City Council having a dedicated social value policy uh, and committing themselves, not just considering, but committing themselves to apply social value to over £330 million <coughs> worth of public procurement, which makes the topic suddenly very interesting, uh, particularly um, beyond just the social enterprise space. The thing that fascinates me very much about social value is it crosses form. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to all come together and collaborate. So we've, um, we've got a diverse panel of speakers that have given up their time to be with you here today, hopefully representing uh, almost all of the business sectors uh, across the board. Um, we'll be live tweeting the event, uh, hashtag on the screens for the SV Forum for those who are that way inclined. Uh, we're also live broadcasting the event thanks to Ecomedia. So I'm going to give a little wave to all of those watching from home and your offices and wherever you might be. Um, including, very kindly, Bristol City Council's social value team, who apparently are all tuning in attentively. So uh, we look forward to sharing some of the insights with the world. So without further ado, as I mentioned, today was about helping to understand how best to measure communicate uh, and embed social value and impact measurement across your organizations. We did a little Twitter poll earlier in the week just to sort of gauge the, the temperature of people's understanding of the space. And it turns out that uh, at least a third of people had absolutely no idea what we were talking about whatsoever, which isn't a massive surprise. About a third of people did and then some a little bit undecided. Um, so this event is hopefully the first of a series of forums to try and share insights, uh, raise the profile of all the good work that we're doing in the space. So, we're gonna keep the, the event very informal. We're gonna have a panel discussion. Each of the speakers have got up to five minutes to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their organizations and their activities. Uh, and then we're gonna open the floor to some questions, really. I have a few of my own if you're feeling shy, uh, but really I think the real richness is about all of you coming away from this event, knowing a little more than you did when you came into the event and having the opportunity to make the most of some of these people sat around me. So. I'll shut up and start talking now uh, and say, I'm not really going to introduce myself a great, a great deal. To my, to my left, we have Margaret Firth, um, Senior Policy Advisor for the Cabinet Office in the Southwest. Um, we have Nick Davis, Founder and CEO of Neighbourly, uh, Bristol's first B Corp. To my immediate left, we've got Ben Franks, Impact and Intelligence Officer at Nightstone Housing. To my right, we've got Jane Strand. Uh, from Trident Reach Charity, representing. And uh, to my furthest right, we've got Richard, MD of the Social Value Business. So, I'm gonna give each of you five minutes to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, you can ask me first. <laughs> Hi then, uh, nice to see you all. Um, oh, where should I start? Um, I've been actually involved with Social Value now for about the last seven or eight years. And um, one of the things, one of the passions of creating the Social Value Business is actually actually seeing people develop and change, and actually seeing people develop and change, but understanding how they develop and change. So the social value business was set up with a primary purpose of understanding and measuring that, and actually also understanding how that can be used, both in the commercial sense, to generate income, but also to consider how that can be used for communication and marketing, partnership development and ultimately to do more. So throughout my own personal journey, I, I, from the commercial sector, having worked for a number of large, large blue chip companies, but also actually from the charity sector as well, having worked for the WRVS many, many moons ago, the Women's Rural Voluntary Service, and as you can say, we don't exactly fit into the mould of WRVS, but I was <coughs> a bit of a, a younger person then. Um, also, over the last seven years, um, we've actually seen over 400 different organisations actually being involved, included, changing the world of social value. Everyone's always done it, 
everyone's always been involved with it, but no one's really understood it. So what we've also seen, um, and the purpose of actually setting up the business, was to help those people to articulate in such a way that a diverse range of stakeholders could understand. Because everybody knows things that no one understands the terminology, everyone calls it by different names, and people like me can always make, also make it a little bit difficult, it feels like sometimes. And that's obviously a challenge. So over, over the last seven years, we've helped actually generate £168 million for organisations by helping them and supporting them to demonstrate impact and value. And having set up about 129 different social enterprises and socially minded organisations. Social value crosses all different sectors, so it's actually regardless of legal structure, which is really, really important. And during that time, we've actually had many different discussions and many different challenges. And those challenges have been around why? Why, why value? Why impact? I actually say, why not? I actually also say it's been around for such a long time, everyone does or has done in the past in different sectors, understood it perhaps as corporate and social responsibility, perhaps it's an evolution of that. So during the last two years we've actually set up the social value quality mark and that's been really important in our personal journey because we believe that developing legitimacy and trust in anything that is imported is the key because unfortunately you can report anything because there are holes. However, by using core ethics and values, you can actually get to the point where you can reduce down, should we say, ambiguity, promote transparency as well. So it's been a long journey, I have to say, but working with a good range of partners, including um, the lovely team at Social Enterprise Works, who's one of our strategic partners, has actually been a positive way of actually having positive influence throughout the UK. So that's me, Richard, from Social Value Business. Thanks very much, Richard. <clears throat> I'm actually going to pass the microphone all the way down to the other end of the table. I'll put you on the spot. There you go. <laughs> Over to you, Margaret. Thank you. Sorry, caught me reading the Twitter feed already. <laughs> um, hello, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Margaret Firth, and I work for a bit for Cabinet Office, which is um, it's called the Office for Civil Society and Innovation. Um, can I ask how many of you have heard of the Office? Innovation. Okay, that's that's more than usual. That's good. Okay, so just to give you a slight bit of background for those half or more of you that don't know what the OCSI is, we're a department within the Cabinet Office, so a government department um, providing support in growing philanthropy, volunteering, community, and business social action. For those of you who've not heard the terminology social action, that means volunteering and a whole lot more. Um, and social investment, um, enabling a more self-sustaining voluntary community and social enterprise sector, uh, and promoting youth involvement and volunteering and social action, particularly in National Citizen Service. So why is that all relevant to today? Um, one of government's key manifesto pledges for 2015 and 2020 was to examine ways to build on innovation and build high quality public services. Um, and one way of doing that is through growing social value. Um, the Social Value Act itself was legislation that came in in 2013. Focus from a government perspective arguably is around the Social Value Act, but actually I think the recognition of social value is a whole lot more than just the Act. Um, social value has an ethos, it's around broader aspirations for growing the social economy. Um, but also has wider links into other aspects of the policy that we work with, with social action and contributing to active communities. So the, the Social Value Act is a, an important tool to help show, shape society. Fundamentally, the Act requires commissioners, those working in the public sector, to think about how they secure social, economic and environmental benefits when they're commissioning <coughs> services. So as we, we, we've already touched on, Bristol, in lots of ways, they're ahead of the game. There's a whole spectrum of different local authorities, public services, and how they're involved in this space. Um, I think the reality is 
any legislative act that's only three years old, actually, to already have a put policy in place and a toolkit and be working towards that, that's actually not bad. Um, Lord Young did a review of the Public Services Act um, a couple of years ago and there were some key recognitions through that that actually it's all around work from government is around promoting, how can we support, how can we grow um, and how can we achieve maximum impact for every pound that's spent through public services and the social value act is a way of doing that. Um, in terms of specific pieces of work government is involved with, we've funded some programmes around testing different models and ways of measuring impact, measuring for social value, um, and we're also celebrating social value through social value awards. <coughs> lots more going on, and actually, in lots of ways, government is just the um, catalyst for the activity, the legislation catalyzes what goes on around social life. It's actually local, it's local communities, how do they engage, how do commissioners engage with their communities, and it's a triangle of public service delivery, commissioners, and society, <coughs> communities, and voluntary communities, social enterprise sector, and business sector as well, and how do they all interact to deliver local social work. Thank wow, you. thank you very much, Mark. Okay. <laughs> that sets the scene nicely. I think Nick, um, Chiming in, really, on the other side of the coin, I suppose, from the private sector. Over to you, Phil. Thank you. So, Nabley, I hope most of you will know, um, being reasonably local, is a social platform that connects companies to community projects at its simplest level. It's designed so that community projects can tell the story of what it is that they need help with. They may need a small amount of funding or some volunteering, and then they can share that amongst their friends, their neighbours, and create digital noise about the thing that they need help with. So that companies on the other side can say, we're gonna make a pledge, we're gonna put some money, some volunteer days on the table, and we're gonna look for projects where we can make the greatest difference. So Navy is a matchmaker trying to bring those two parties together. But I want to talk about why. Why would business do that? Why do companies like Marks and Spencers and Starbucks and Heineken care? And how can I show you that this is real? There's a huge amount of data that actually evidences that this is good for business to pursue a CSV strategy, a creating shared value strategy. Everyone accepts today that CSR is dead, it should be dead, it's ticking the box of corporate social responsibility. Today you've got to create shared value. And what that's saying is you're making sure that you're contributing to society, but actually as a business you have to be prosperous as well because only <coughs> business creates jobs and they're quite important to our collective social future. So business cares because at its core, the colleagues, the staff that work for big brands increasingly really do care about where they work and they want to work for a company that is allowing them to be their whole self. Gone are the days when people would accept that they would leave some of their values at the threshold when they went into work on any given day. You want to be your whole self in your work, particularly millennials. And so increasingly, big business is starting to recognize if they want to attract the very best talent, they have to be demonstrably better at engaging those people in playing their role in society. That's fairly fundamental for business when it comes to talent. But also the consumers on this journey as well, and, and brands like Unilever are now constantly referencing the fact that this is no longer a fringe issue. This isn't about green anymore. This is now mainstreaming. And if you project 10 years out, you start to see real evidence that says if your business isn't making, isn't contributing, doesn't have purpose at its heart, that business probably won't be relevant within 10 years. So it's time to start making those changes now. In making those changes, it actually starts to create messaging and ultimately commercial opportunities. It's a win-win-win. You can help society by being a better business and that's good for business. But I think the bit that's most interesting for me, and I think that is probably the most recent on this journey, is that investors now are really starting to look to encourage the businesses that they invest in to get closer and further into purpose and social value. And that's simply because of risk. Investors understand risk. They're looking for risk across their portfolio. And increasingly, any organizations not recognizing their responsibilities and changing their strategies in a world of finite, resor finite resources is going to be showing more risk. 
when you get to a place that investors start driving the agenda, then we will start to see an exponential push of business, led by big global business, encouraging everybody to collaborate and do their part. So finally, I believe, and I hope I can show you, that the business really genuinely wants to contribute to social value, to creating shared value, and wants to be the catalyst for seeing this happen. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much. I think that's a very insightful perspectives. On the other side of the spectrum, um, Trident Hair and Reach. Yes. Over to you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jane Strand. I'm from Trident Reach, the People Charity. We are um, a Birmingham-based charity, but we work across the whole of the West and East Midlands. Um, we're a fairly big care and support charity and the sort of care and support arm of a housing association. Um, we've got about £14 million turnover, um, nearly 800 staff, and we work across um, every kind of service provision that you can kind of work with, really, um, from domestic violence to homeless to learning disabilities and registered care. Um, I'm lucky enough that Birmingham have committed to social value in a huge way. Um, all of our tenders require 20% uh, weighting on social value, so that makes my job nice and busy, um, which I'll probably talk a bit more about shortly, so I won't go too much into that. My role within the charity is Impact and Evaluation Manager and Social Value Lead. So I have to um, translate what the Social Value Act means in practical terms for the support worker, for the manager, for somebody who's monitoring um, all that, all those statistics, um, which is actually quite a difficult thing. What I love about social value is that there's no one answer, and what I hate about social value is that there's no one answer, um, and, and so I'm sure everybody kind of feels that difficulty as well. Um, that's pretty much it. I think I'll, I'll talk probably a little <laughs> bit more around Birmingham and what we do there and how it's, um, it's quite forward thinking in the sector and, um, and how that impacts on our organisation separately. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. And last but by no means least, Ben. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. So my name is Ben Franks um, and I work for Nightstone Housing Association um, as their Impact and Intelligence Officer. Um, I've been with Nightstone now for about 15 or 16 months and one of my key roles and responsibilities is evaluating the social impacts um, of our services um, and before that my other previous experience working with social impact was working with the WEA who are a educational charity and um, one of their offices is based in Bristol and that's where I worked um, and I helped them to um, design and collect data and, and write their first social impact report and that was back in I think 2013 or 2014. Um, so, Nightstone then. Um, Nightstone are, um, we're a provider of affordable social housing. Um, we have around 11,000 homes, um, and these are concentrated within, across Somerset and the west of England. And in that area, we uh, provide homes and services to about 23,000 people, so a um, fairly large amount there. Um, and these are people on the whole who, um, if it wasn't for people like um, for housing associations and local authorities might struggle to gain access to housing through the private rental market due to any number of their own sort of personal circumstances right from um, their economic position, um, their financial position, also other um, things like their age or um, even their mental or physical health. So I think it's been said before and I would um, definitely agree that perhaps the biggest impact of housing associations is simply putting a, a, a roof over people's heads who, um, and their families who might not otherwise. Um, but at Nightstone, that's not where our social impact ends. Um, we, the, the particular department that I work for within Nightstone um, is, the, is Individual and Community Empowerment, is what the department's called, or ICE for short. Um, and they were, um, the department was created in 2011 um, in the kind of midst of the downturn and the recession, really to try and support our residents to be able to kind of um, get on their feet when they need to or um, provide support for them in, in times of crisis, you know, when their problems are really being compounded um, through, the, through the downturn. Um, so 
In terms of its makeup, ICE is made up of uh, three key services that each do something slightly different. So we've got our community empowerment service, which um, looks to uh, empower um, people living in their community so they might kind of um, make where they live um, kind of uh, sustainable and resilient communities. We have our individual empowerment service as well, which focuses on the individuals through lots of different um, uh, issues that they might be facing. Um, and then our residents involvement team as well, which is all about getting our customers and residents involved in the decisions that, that really affect them. Um, and from its foundations really, ICE is all about creating positive social impact. That's, that's what it does. Um, and it's always done it and I think probably from the word go it might just might not realize that it was doing it and it wasn't until about 2013 um, that the idea first came about to start bottling this social impact in a way that um, they could really kind of um, learn from what they were doing through through the use of data and also communicating it as well to our stakeholders so our um, our partners, our um, colleagues, and most importantly, our residents as well, so they could see where their rents were going and in terms of value for money that the service um, that we provide was, was yeah, providing them with um, value for money. Um, so we started off actually um, by going through the, the Make It Happen consultancy, um, which um, Richard's, Rich, so it's like Richard basically, um, just to sign a, get us on our feet and, and tell us where we needed to, to start to be able to get into a position where we were able to start collecting data and evaluating our social impact. Um, and that report that, was, um, that they produced for us gave us a lot to go on. Um, and since then, we've been designing methodologies and theories of change and embedding social impact into everything that we do, really. Um, we've uh, produced one social impact report um, in the middle of last year, and our, our next one's out this year. Um, and it's pretty much one of the most important kind of um, parts of our reporting for the department that I work in. So that's it. Mm, thank you ever so much. That's really interesting. Um, so before opening up to the floor for questions, I, uh, I'm going to swing this mic down down to the end there. I just had a question for each of you out of curiosity before opening up. I'm sure I'll give you the chance to think of some questions before I put you all on the spot. Um, but Margaret, I was curious to understand how effective you feel the uh, the Social Value Act has been in practice from the government's perspective? Um, as I think as I said in my introduction, the uh, Social Value Act is only three years old. I think the general feeling is it's been effective in raising, certainly raising awareness of social value. It's brought about change, looking at public services in a different way, bringing this into people's consciousness. Um, but there is a recognition certainly, and Lord Young and his review identified this, that there are areas for improvement, better awareness, so an event like today is, is really helpful. Um, increased take-up, I think, um, across local authorities, housing associations, actually many have been quite proactive. Um, I think the review identified that central government departments and health were probably not as responsive to social value act as some of the authorities have been. I think Birmingham is, you know, it's great to see Jane here with that um, experience. Birmingham is one of the shining examples. I think Manchester have done a lot of work. Certainly, um, so I think it's, it's a moving piece. I think one of the things, I can't remember who touched on it, but the Social Value Act actually left a lot of local flexibility within it. It was a piece of legislation that wasn't completely prescriptive. Uh, and I think depending on your perspective, that's either a, a positive or a negative. Um, some would look to government and ask, well, how do we measure this? How do we do it? Where's the guidance from central government to tell us what to do? Um, if you're from that perspective, maybe the act doesn't quite work as you might hope. I think the, the spirit and freedom behind the act was actually, it's for local areas, local commissioners to identify what their priorities are locally, how they wish to measure it, so that the Act provides those freedoms and flexibilities, which is why you've got different lengths of journeys and different lengths of engagement in different areas because of the freedom and flexibility of the Act allowed. Um, again, Lord Young's review identified that that measure measurement was an issue and different levels of consistency and different ways for commissioners to evaluate and understand their bids so that they do secure value for money. So I think, I would say, Direct answer to your question: How effective? <laughs> I think 
think it's mixed. So it really is dependent on <coughs> how the local commissioning environment has responded to the Act. The local um, implementation, essentially, yeah, from the yeah. authorities. And like you say, Bristol uh, Council, who might be watching, we have to praise them because they are one of the leading lights in the country, essentially, alongside Birmingham, Manchester and others, who are actually taking it forward and adopting it uh, because the Act only encourages councils to consider it. So Bristol have the option to consider against doing anything and they decided to jump in with two feet, launch a policy and talk it to help us take it forward. So, um, yeah, it feels like we're uh, on the right curve of, of progress. Yeah, certainly. I think it might be worth mentioning as well, earlier in the year, um, jointly with Social Enterprise UK, um, the Cabinet Office held the first ever Social Value Summit and Social Value Awards. Um, and categories were around Social Value Leadership for an organisation, Social Value Leadership um, for individuals, Promoting a Mainstream Social Value Act Award and Driving Value for Money Award. Um, and if you're interested, those the nominated and the winners are identified on the Cabinet Office website. So that gives you some examples and case studies some some of the people that are involved in this space. Um, and just the fact those awards happened and there was great appetite and people put in applications demonstrates that there is a lot of activity out there um, and a lot of varied activity to learn from, but it can only grow and, and be more of it. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Ranga. Moving down the uh, down the line as it were, Nick. Um, I guess you could take that one for Margaret. How um can you give us some examples of, of uh, some of your work of how private businesses are creating social value? So I can pick up exactly from where Margaret's left off and tell you that increasingly um, I've now got private companies coming to Navely to say we understand that we have an opportunity in leveraging the Social Value Act and some of the tenders that they're now out, um, uh, looking to submit for recognising that maybe they have capacity and they've got extra capacity to bring to local councils, to local um, environments to try and get more done. So if you are, let's say, a large technology company and you employ a couple of thousand people, that's a lot of volunteering time in an environment where you want to encourage people to take their volunteering days because you know it's good for business. And you really want to deploy it with experts locally who know how and where that volunteering can best de be deployed. So, so we've got companies proactively coming to us and saying we want to work with you so that we can work collaboratively with a local council because we can engineer this all around the Social Value Act. So that's really positive. Um, what other examples were you thinking? Oh, well, another thing in particular, I was just, um, I, I guess, representing, um, working closely with private sector organisations, really. I just guess a bit of a, a, an understanding of how are they achieving that impact? Could you give us some examples of some of your live projects? Yeah, absolutely. So what I think is really interesting is that um, we've been on a journey with some of our founding clients. We've been live for about 21, 22 months now. And we've been through some really notable steps where organizations are scaling up. So they're starting out to deploying a little bit of funding in one region perhaps to see how, how the platform can help facilitate these local engagements, maybe a bit of volunteering. But a number of things are happening, a number of evidence-based things are happening that are encouraging them to do more. First of all, feedback from colleagues, really easily measured, really positive when you empower your colleagues to choose how they want to volunteer within their local environment. Suddenly that has much more meaning and relevance to people. And so therefore, their engagement with the program and therefore with the brand that's facilitating that really, really does go up you're also starting to be able to turn all of those little authentic acts into quite powerful storytelling, which is of course what brands love to do. And there's a major difference today between a constructed advertising campaign that many of you will have little time for, because you see through it today, to something that is authentically demonstrating an act of engagement where actually a brand delivered something, had some purpose. So those stories are all starting to bubble up and become really interesting content, often co-created content with local communities, which is even more powerful, that marketing people are starting to think, actually, there's some leverage there. And then you can really start to get to data. You can start to look at reach. How many projects did we engage? How many people were engaged in that project? How far did they share that? And then you start to get a measure of you know, scale and sentiment. And the most exciting bit is sentiment because... When a company does something authentic, people talk about it. It's very hard as a brand to get people talking positively, genuinely and authentically about what you're doing. So if you're doing something that really resonates, that sentiment score and that authenticity really starts to come through and that has, that has high value. 
So we're getting to a place now where the companies using Navy are really scaling up nationally, but the real breakthrough is the recognition that, take Marks and Spencers, they've got 83,000 staff that they want to volunteer through the platform, but they've got 34 million customers. And they're at the place now where they're saying, if we can use our staff to be the catalyst, if we can say, we're gonna go and do a beach clean and it needs 20 people, and we can send four from the local store, but we need another 16 people who, from our customers, want to go and fill in those 16 spots. You've got a brand that people trust inviting you to go and participate in an act of purpose in your local community. And for many people, most people, most of us, probably think, I could do a little bit more. I'm nervous about this word volunteering because I don't know if I want to commit myself, but I could do little things, little acts of kindness that help along the way. I could do my little bit of social impact. And when a brand that you trust asks you to get involved, that might just be the catalyst to get you doing that little bit more. And when companies start to think in that way, then we're at the tipping point of an exponential curve towards really having impact at scale. And that's where, for me, what business has to bring gets quite exciting. Exciting stuff, Nick. Thanks ever so much for sharing. <coughs> ben, I guess um, next along the, uh, the line, as it were, I was curious from uh, your perspective and experiences, uh, what difference you feel that embedding um, social value and impact measurement across your organisation has had? Um, okay, Carl, well, I think just to say, first of all, that actually we haven't embedded social impact across the whole organisation yet. It's something that we're looking at doing in the future. Um, but at the moment, we've embedded social impact in the particular department which I work within, which is the community investment um, kind of uh, department, or ICE, as I said earlier. Um, I think that seemed like the obvious place to start, looking at social impact, um, just, because of, just because of what it does, basically. Um, and as a, so too, yeah, thinking about the benefits to it, I think as a fairly new department within the organization, I think they were still starting to find their feet, if you like, just um, in, their, in their kind of first couple of years and um, finding, you know, we'd, we'd get kind of requests for information and, and, and stats about our, kind of our performance measures and things like that. And these were sometimes, you know, not directly linked to the type of impact which a community investment um, uh, kind of sector would, would, would produce. So I think perhaps the most important benefit has been to really get us to think about what it is we're doing as, as uh, I say an organisation actually, but yeah, you know, you know what I mean, so, so what we're actually doing as, as a directorate. So um, I sort of bullet pointed a few things that I think are, are really important, but yeah, so carrying on from where I left, I think that it's made data collection a lot easier. So when we get requests for information, either from um, partner agencies or our communication department, we've got them at our fingertips to easily just um, to, to send out. We know they're accurate. We've got data to back, back up our claims. So that's something that's really important. Um, I think also um, it's uh, focused what we do. So. Um, one of the first stages of embedding social impact was to create our theory of change models for, for each of the services that make up ICE. Um, and from there, you can really pinpoint and track down exactly the types of actions and activities that, you, that we need to be doing to meet our social impact objectives. Um, so that's been really useful. Also, as a housing provider, we're responsible to our stakeholders, primarily that's our residents, they want, they want to know where their, their money is going, going towards and being able to easily um, um, communicate our social impact to them as well as internally has really helped us to demonstrate our value for money as a service if you like, so that's something else. Um, also having this data and information, case studies, all sorts of information directly at our fingertips makes it easy for us to see where it is we could be learning from the learning from what we've done in the past and, and planning and improving for the future as well. So. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, man. Jane. Thank you. So from your um experiences of working uh, in Birmingham. I was wondering whether Bristol has much to learn or uh, things to learn from your experiences of uh, Birmingham Council's development around social value. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so as I said sort of earlier, um, Birmingham have committed in, in a huge way really, um, probably quite forward thinking across the country in that um, all of the tenders now uh, for the whole of the uh, city are 20% weighted on social value. Um, I think what it's started to do is that it's making everybody think about their impact and how um, mutual benefit can be created throughout the, the city and sort of consolidated as well. Um, what they brought in as part of the tender process was that any um, commissioning and any providers have to sign up to the Birmingham Business Charter for social responsibility. Um, and what that means is that that as an organisation, if we if the council is going to offer you money, you have to promise to have an impact on the local environment, on the local economy, and socially. Um, and the six principles, and this was really useful because even though obviously I'm sure lots of our organisations we already create an impact, whether we call it social value, impact measurement, whatever. Um, it really helped me to fit monitoring and that impact into different areas really. The, the six principles, I wrote them down so I didn't forget <laughs> them. Um, so we've got buy Birmingham first, good employer, uh, local employer, partners in communities, green and sustainable and ethical procurement. And I, from really working on the ground and, and from also such a big organisation and it being so diverse, I really believe that the value that we create and measure can fall into one of those categories, um, whatever it is, or it can kind of be fitted in. Um, so for me, that was a really, really good foundation and a really good base to then grow the rest of our, our value and think, okay, where else can we make value? How can we monitor this? Um, and with everything, obviously, that we create, it needs to be um, calculated and, and, and reported on. Um, so that was the difficult bit. Um, what Birmingham have done, which I think is really important, is the, the, the really forward thinking and sort of collaborative working. So across the different public sectors, um, they're talking to each other and they're trying to say, OK, let's not necessarily pool our resources, but how can we benefit each other? How can we create shared value for the city? Um, and, and that's been useful as a provider. Um, they're really heavy in partnership working, so again, um, about creating that mutual benefit. One of the things that they like to do, which we really appreciate as providers, because we're working on the ground, um, is um, consultation. So they've been really, um, they, they've used us a lot more, rather than just sort of from the top down, they've actually said, okay, what does it look like for the people who, who create this value? Um, and I sort of took it upon myself um, about a year ago to create a social value, social value study club. Um, one, because I quite like meetings and socialising. Um, two, because I kind of wanted to position us as the almost the go-to um, group, really. Um, and that was made up of um, all SP uh, contract holders. So again, it's across the city, um, regional. Um, and three, because social value is quite a lonely place, um, my role, there's only one of me in the whole of 800 people, so I feel like I'm constantly banging on at people to give me their statistics, to create more value, to understand what on earth social value means. Um, so it was that was really useful, I found, just to talk to people in the same um, position as me, I suppose. And the city, uh, the council have been really open in that, um, in that they are now talking to us and using us as that group to say, does this work? What do you think about that? How can we work together? So um, maybe, I mean, that's that's really positive that the council are really open. When we did um, tendering for, so going back two years, um, we didn't have what, we didn't understand what social value was. We brought in Richard, um, because we were tendering 14 million pounds worth of contracts. 20% of that was resting on me, pretty much. Um, no pressure. I know, <laughs> so that's why I sort of needed Richard's help to, as I say, just to kind of understand what it looked like. Um, when we first, uh, when the, the business charter came out, I don't think the council really 
they wanted offers, so they they kind of said, "What's your um, your social value offer in relation to these six principles?" So lots of people just made it up as you as you kind of go along, and they thought, "Okay, this looks good. This is um, we can create value there. Let's put that in." And that was, as I say, it was good, but it was too wide. It was too much. Um, it was a bit grey. So then, when we came round to um, tender this this last year, they then gave out some guidance notes. Um, and that might be so. How what percentage of your spend is with SMEs? How many volunteers are you going to create? Um, There's obviously a lot more indicators, but they, 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 there was guidance notes and points between um, for every single principle. So they're obviously learning a lot more from what all the providers are doing, and then we can then learn a lot more from them. So I think that they've been. It's kind of been a two-way relationship, um, and that's been really valuable. And and they haven't been saying it needs to be this specific way. Yeah. Probably because they don't know themselves, because it is so such a wide um, understanding. But um, let me just see if there was anything else. That I think that was the main thing. <laughs> well, that's all been really insightful, and I guess it's worth mentioning that we've been on a, quite a similar journey here in Bristol, I suppose, because we had a big consultation for those mm-hmm. who are unaware before Christmas. Uh, and Bristol City Council actually we tweeted out links um, to they've got a dedicated policy and toolkit. Uh, so Bristol City Council <laughs> have um, done the the legwork. Uh, and all credit to their team really for pulling it together a whole bunch of useful resources and information that's freely available on their website um, so yeah similarly mm. to Birmingham trying to be as supportive as possible really in working with providers uh, to help increase mm. awareness of uh, what it's all about but thanks for sharing Rich so Rich I wanted to ask you Mr Social Value Business um, to those in the room who might be relatively new to the space uh, and newbies that are interested uh, are coming to Social Value starting their Social Value journey uh, for the first time or very early on, what advice would you give to first timers approaching this rather complex topic? Don't panic. Okay. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, if you do panic, you're probably in very good company because um, there will be others <laughs> very similar to you um, who are embarking on their journey. What we found is probably two thirds of organisations are still considering what to do her terminology, they considering what's important to them, but they don't really know what direction to take. And it's actually kind of linking into what you're saying there, Carl, is it's doing some homework. It's doing some homework in terms of your stakeholders. It's actually speaking to your stakeholders, so people that actually have a financial or non-financial stake in your organisation, influence, etc., and finding out what they want from you. So the council, for example, have a very clear idea on the value they're expecting or certainly some, some guidance. But then you think the NHS, you think housing associations, you think um, crime and justice, you think DWPs, etc. cetera, this world. All of which actually have their own different requirements or definitions of what they're looking for. So do some homework is the first thing. Second thing, Again, don't worry. But leading into that is actually speak to your service users or speak to your customers and ask three core questions. <coughs> One, what do they value about you as an organisation? Because actually, if you're going to measure something, isn't it about measuring what people value? Second thing is actually find out how important they find you or your organisation. So, what's important to them? Third, third question even, is how influential are you on them or are them on you? Because again, the more you understand about your, your wider stakeholders, the better it is going to be for you. And then use the information and consider actually targeting what you measure going forward because it is a daunting experience because there are so many ways there's over a hundred different ways of measuring outcomes and impact so many different terminology but simply create a range of pledges actually thinking about what you're trying to achieve as an organisation socially so create social value pledges perhaps across the core themes of our community, health, education, justice, employment, housing, economic, and actually then measure 
your performance, measure what you've achieved against those. And what you've done probably is reduce down your workload by about 75% because you're only measuring what's of value. And then you actually look about the, the journey. The journey is actually equally, as, if not more important than the outcome of what you're going to achieve. Because you actually learn quite a bit. You learn more about what you're achieving, what's good and what's bad. So it's not just in isolation. Social value is a tool for business development, business growth, income generation, understanding your clients, understanding um, the future direction. And then actually embedding the whole world of social value and the terminology. So I'm sure all of you today, there are questions around what actually is social value. What is impact? What is outcomes? What is outputs? Actually, it's about creating your own definition and being very articulate, articulate, should I say, um, in what that means. So for example, outcomes is about change. So I feel better today, great, that's a change. What people are looking for is a difference that change makes, i.e. impact. So as a result of me feeling better today, am I going to go to the gym and perhaps lose a little bit of weight? So that's an impact. So value or social value is what value people place on that. So public sector places a lot of financial value, cost saving, resource saving. Funders may be about engaging with hard to reach communities, hard to reach people. Also thinking about the partnerships that you form. So it can be a combination. And the final kind of aspect I would say is actually very, very simple. It is on your day-to-day -day engagement with your customers, ask two questions. What has changed for you as a result of my organization or company? What difference has that made to you? And by definition, over a course of a period of time, you would collect all that data that you need to do something with. But just remember, there's no one universal way of measuring value because value in itself has not been clearly identified across the whole of the UK albeit there's obviously guidelines within the Social Values Act mm. I hope that's helpful I, I hope so. I saw lots of people scribbling notes, so I think that Ooh. might have, uh, might have, might have um, yeah. helped nudge us a little bit along. Now, um, I wanted to open the floor. I don't want to talk at you this entire time. I appreciate you've uh, had a lot to wrap your heads around. I wanted to open up some questions from the floor, ideally to take more than one at a time. I'm going to ask Nadia to come and grab a microphone. And I'm pleading that, uh, that's, that somebody would like to ask a question. Wonderful. Sorry, I guess it's worth introducing us. I might know who you are, but perhaps others don't. It's on, but it's not very loud, sorry. Okay. Hello, um, Ed Roberts from Bristol Capital. I'm, I'm really interested in the um, interplay between uh, social value and impact. Um, Austerity is obviously a huge issue at the moment. Um, and it's not really for example, uh, if you take the prosperity, obviously there, there, there are less resources at the disposal of local authorities and potentially housing associations. Um, how's that money used better? Well, the Social, the Social Value Act is potentially a tool, but it's, it's used better, more, more intelligently, and businesses respond to that, recognise that there's potential business opportunity by um, recognising social value in their bids. Um, there's then the potential for businesses as you were saying, I thought that was really interesting. Big, big project, lots of staff there move into a space to do something that might have been otherwise funded by the state. So, I suppose the number of my question is Is a fully effective social value act sufficient to offset, offset the impact of austerity in the long term? I was going to take a few questions, but that's such a big one that we might try and perhaps um, jump into. Nick Second Keen. Thanks, Ed. Good question. Um, so, one of the things that happened post-recession was, and one of the drivers for business <coughs> deciding that it really is time to step emphatically into this space was the massive breakdown in trust. So 
there's a global survey run by Edelman that in 2009-2010 showed that the majority of people that they surveyed in the world wouldn't care if 90% of brands disappeared, just ceased to exist. So that breakdown in trust was fundamental and emphatic at that time. And so businesses, that's what's tipped them all in. They've got to really rebuild from that, from that terrible position. At the same time, of course, you do have austerity. And the, the well, uh, I think every council has their version of the graph of doom that I've seen many times, which basically shows that the cost of social care and recycling gradually starts to outweigh the um, capex left within the, in, within the council's budget. There's no money left. Now, as society, people who run small, local, charitable projects are being told, you can't rely on us for grant funding anymore. And this has been happening for a couple of years. So many small local charities have had time to think about what they're going to do. But for many, it's still a shock. They've relied on grants for all of this time. And so there's a growing expectation within society that A, somebody else should step in, B, there should be tools to help us organize ourselves because we want to organize ourselves. We live in a digital age. There should be stuff to help us get this done, to help companies get more involved. I think the Social Value Act just simply oils the wheels of that. If you've got business recognizing that there's an opportunity in society saying, right, we're going to give you a shot here because it's time for you to show that you're relevant to me in the future, then the Social Value Act can just simply accelerate that. So I think it's a really important combination of legislation and commercial intention that's making all of this change happen. Interesting. Anybody else want to chime in? Um, yeah, just to add um, a little bit from my perspective, I think that it's around shared value and creating benefit. So um, obviously we know that we, the money is reducing, especially around housing associations and social care. Um, one of the things which I do, which is part of the ethical procurement principle in the Birmingham City uh, the Charter, um, so where they ask us for our um, social value offer, when we um, procure out, so one of our recent ones was a um, hazardous waste contract, it wasn't a great amount of money, but what I implemented in there was I want to know your social value offer if we're going to choose you. So um, that could be around, um, I don't know, PPE training, um, it could be around paying for a, a, a part-time apprenticeship. Um, some volunteering, some training in, in whatever, but they're benefiting from us and we're benefiting from them. So we might not be able to pay for a volunteer's um, expenses for the next year, however they're going to, and they don't mind doing it, and we've got that shared benefit there. So I think that in some ways um, it, it can be sort of topped up, if you know what I mean. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. I, I, I'm really sorry, I've got a childcare crisis, so I've got to run away early. But just to, I think, broaden the debate a little bit to answer Ed's question. And I think, you know, our focus here today is the Social Value Act, but a lot of the things, um, certainly my bit of, the bit of government that I work for is looking at, is actually broadening those partnerships between business sector, voluntary community, social enterprise sector, public sector, communities. So, yes, we have less public funding out there for core services, but actually if you look at innovative partnerships with the ones you know, Jane mentioned, you could do that through the Social Value Act, you could do, do that with effective partnership working um, with other businesses. It doesn't solve the complete crisis, but you know, innovative ways of looking at it, looking at your social investment in different ways, drawing social investment finance into the delivery of public services is a new way of looking at that, which I know you're very familiar with. Um, I just wanted, as I do have to run away, just to highlight a couple of resources that you may or may not be aware of. Um, both have had a little bit of um, government funding, but through big partnerships with other organisations as well. And the first of those is the Social Value Hub, which is hosted by Social Enterprise UK, which is really good and has lots of different resources, case studies, tools, well worth a look at. And if you're particularly interested in... Um, impact measurement, monitoring, looking at how you measure your value, inspiringimpact.org.uk as well um, is again a partnership approach bringing lots of different um, impact measurement tools together and you can do a diagnostic tool which is called measuring up where you can do a diagnostic and help identify which impact tools might be right for you um, and if you're interested in more along the um, 
social investment measuring impact on a, a greater scale. There's a cost unit cost database that's established on the government website as well. So that will put different costs against different activities that will be recognised if you're looking at to work out impact and value for things. If you didn't get any of that, I can send you the link. So I'll we'll tweet some links out later. Yeah. Anyway, Wonderful. You. Do you guys want to try me? I was going to take some more questions. We've got some racking up now, so I might take a couple. <coughs> I have to talk up a little bit, sorry for the microphone's terrible, T apologies. Fantastic, that'd be great. Um, I'll take another couple of questions. So Get the panel to start I'm just wondering how you ensure that uh, companies buy into your values and are not simply buying social values. Buy into our values? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, sorry, my name is uh, Paul Revolta from the region of New York. Um, so the follow-up question, I mean, it's just so general how the social value and what extent it's driven business contracts towards bona fide social enterprises and to what extent it's nudged I guess um, I'm actually going to take a quick response to that before uh, I'm inviting the, the panel to do so. It's interesting, we, um, we launched a social value support service uh, a few months back along the line shortly after the council announced, it, announced its intentions. Uh, the first response that we got back was from a massive uh, national multi-million pan organisation looking for a local social enterprise to tick a box in a procurement contract. Now, I don't sort of stray away from Big Candy. Uh, I'd like to think that the Act can try and level the playing field, but it was interesting that the immediate uh, response, really, from, from the world was about the brokerage and about how do we sort of collaborate. So it's, um, yeah, I think there's some interesting uh, things to come, but I'll uh, open it up. Any one of those questions? You didn't get a chance to talk last time, so... Oh, I'll talk now. Thank you. Um, actually, it's a really good question all about. Um, what we've seen is social values actually obviously across everything and people still perceive it as just a third sector charity social enterprise entity which it isn't. Um, we've witnessed a number of SMEs which have been disappointed that social value is perceived to be just in the third sector because what they say is actually value should be created as part of an ongoing culture. So just because um, it's not necessarily a not-for-profit, it can still create value, i.e. along the lines of increased staff training, inward investment, um, environmental, doing things differently in that respect. What we've seen that is the small to medium um, enterprises are starting to be more considerate about how they can support the social sector. And that's what I would actually call the third sector now. So it's a social sector of people who have a passion and enthusiasm to do things different and challenge the norm. So they're actually embedding it into a procurement cycles and actually giving smaller companies, socially minded organisations, more of a chance. And yes, it's a tick box. Can't, you know, it's always going to be a tick box in some ways. But then if you go back to the overall motive and say, actually, today we've got 35 people and next amount of people streaming people are starting to see things differently. So it's actually all about people power in some ways. That as a collective, when we start to see things differently, we start to act differently. We start to act differently, we start to do things differently. And that's what's starting to come through. So there are some very, very multinational organizations who are being forced into it. Some of which have done it for many years. But also we've got to consider the CSR <coughs> strategy within the European Union which actually does actually mention social value as a concept. So it's not just um, a, a local or UK based. And probably the other thing from that, as a private limited company, actually, I like to think that I'm socially and ethically driven. Is that not actually value in itself? Because I choose to pay what we choose to pay based on what we can afford. 
we, we look about actually engaging with local communities to inform. It's not profit at all cost. So I think as long as we don't just consider social value to be cost savings to the public purse and can see it as a wider context, then yes. Otherwise, unfortunately, yes, it can still be a trick box. Um, favourite story from the field? Favourite story from the field? Actually, um, actually yeah. South West based organisation who have purchased a fleet, as we say, of mopeds to support young people who are going through employment uh, employability training and they provide them for a period of six months <coughs> to enable them to get about, to go to job interviews and to actually go and start employment to reduce the barriers of mobility. And after six months, if they retain that employment, they're actually given the location. Okay. That's quite that's a lovely story. And I appreciate you didn't get a chance to talk last time either. So yeah. So hi. So I've, I've just got a, a relatively quick answer. I don't work on the social value through procurement at Knightstone Housing, but I, I do have some knowledge about it. And, it. and it was for your your questions, the second one, which was, I believe, how do you get companies to buy in um, into your social social values? Is that about right? Oh, was that up there? So sorry. focus question. Yeah. 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 yeah sorry. So. Just to say that, in a way, the, the kind of market um, would dictate it. I mean, so we, we've embedded like, like um, lots of social enterprises and, and local authorities, we've embedded social value in the procurement process. Um, so, which means that, you know, as a housing association with the amount of homes that we have, means that we, um, we tendered 90 million pounds worth of contracts, so over, over a 10 year period. Um, and then social value, is, as I said, is built into these process. So it's something that um, the, con the contractors or whoever whoever we're considering for these for these contracts get mar marked against it. So <clears throat> in that sense, it's within their interest to match their social value offers to the kinds of things that we would expect and we would want <coughs> from them. And in that sense, we, we got some good offers in terms of um, helping um, creating jobs, volunteering, as well as like energy awareness and um, other aspects like um, energy efficiency and things like that within their homes. So, in a sense, it was it was just in their their interest rather than just offering what they wanted. So. And do you have a favourite example from your experiences? Of I mean, as I said, I don't really I don't yeah. tend to work in that area, but. Um, so no, I haven't got any funny anecdotes or anything. So. I'm sure you two certainly do. So I guess <laughs> maybe um, over to you. Yeah. Um, so Fergus, to your question first about uh, buying into our values, I think that's it's really important that we do have values as Neighbourly. If we're trying to create a platform for social action, what do we stand for? We stand for this badge here, B Corporations. Um, B Corporations are a movement that came out of the US a few years ago, which are companies which want to stand for people, planet and profit, but still be limited companies. In order for Nably to achieve its objectives, we cannot be asset locked. We have to be able to raise money because we're building quite a big website. Um, so we have to be able to access financial markets, but we want to be mission locked. We want to be able to held, held accountable for what we're doing for people and planet, as well as for our shareholders. And B corporations give us the opportunity to do that. We can change our articles of association so that as a business, as directors, we now don't have a legal duty to maximize performance for shareholders. We now have a legal duty to maximize contribution to people and planet as well as shareholders. So that's a really important statement of intent for us as a business. With regards to the companies and the big brands that we work with, how do we make sure they buy in? To be honest, if they start working with us, they pretty much worked it out. And the only thing that we sometimes have to do is just remind that their activity has to be authentic. And if it strays a little bit too close to becoming a campaign or could be perceived as a sales promotion exercise, that's not going to resonate as well. And so I have to say it's really light touch because the brilliant thought leader brands that we're working with and talking to all know that this is about taking risks. And to some of my favorite examples, going back to the first question, less about leveraging the Social Value Act, but certainly um, demonstrable examples of creating social value. I think my, maybe my favorite one is an example, I can't remember the name of the brand, but it's a US telco company who connected through technology 
young South American students who wanted to practice their English with a care home in America for older residents who had nobody to talk to. Nobody came to visit them. So they were linked up, um, a care home resident with a student, and once a week they would have a conversation. And the way those relationships developed across the, the course of a term was really incredible to watch. It was a beautiful, moving film to show that actually there was so much value being exchanged between the student and the old person. And it's a wonderful example of how if you think laterally and really start to think about contribution, you can do some amazing things that if you all knew that brand, you'd go and tell somebody about it. So I'm annoyed that I can't remember the name. <laughs> Um, other examples in the UK, Barclays and their Digital Eagles program, they have 11,000 Digital Eagles now in their branches, people who are trained up to help anybody within the community who wants to come and say, show me how to use uh, Skype, for example. It's a social initiative that because they're rooted in local communities, they have the opportunity to deliver, but they're still making a fairly fundamental risk-based decision to say, is this something we should do? And I've got one more, which is um, uh, Steve Howarth at IKEA, I don't know if you saw this, about four or five weeks ago, he said publicly that he thinks the world has reached peak stuff. So what he's basically saying in that moment is, we as IKEA recognize that we shouldn't be trying to encourage people to buy things that they really don't need. We've got to start to think differently about how we supply demand, but how we perhaps educate people towards upcycling, reusing, closed loop systems, and build that into our product as well. So in social value terms, that's a really brave thing to do, brave thing to say, and yet it's an organization that recognizes if they do it now and show leadership, it's actually more likely to come back around to them. Insightful as ever, thanks ever so much. And uh, cheers. Um, my answer was around social, um, innovative social value. Um, one that springs to mind is um, we have every quarter, so one day every quarter we have what we call a reach up day um, and it basically means that the whole charity puts down their usual work um, to have fun days basically. Um, so it's almost, for the staff it's almost like four days off a year, they have to work with the customers um, but it creates massive amounts of value just in one day alone. So for example, um, there's four outcomes that the activity has to and the day has to fit into. Uh, fundraising, um, awareness raising, uh, skills development or, or enjoyment. Um, and the, the different services, so we have 52 schemes across the whole charity and the different services have to um, create an event and it can fit into one of those four outcomes. It doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes they take care home customers to the beach. Another day they'll go bowling. Another day they'll have a, a music festival or whatever. Um, but for those days alone, um, you've got your partnership working. So it's working within the community. We've got um, community engagement, reduced isolation for the customers. Um, the staff appreciate the days because they really look forward to them. We give it to the um, the more the, the less senior members of staff to um, organize them and facilitate them. So it's a bit of extra learning for them. So it's the skills development. Um, and then everybody gets involved. So um, over the course of the year, there was sort of, across four days, there was sort of 800 uh, customers getting involved in community projects, doing one of those four outcomes, something like 600 staff. Um, and I think the last one was, we had something like 300 community members. So we're engaged in the community and we're hitting those three elements of social value just in those four days across the year. Um, so I loved that uh, and, and I really um, promote all that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that I loved, I can't remember any of the examples, but I don't know if anybody's seen the home base advert. Um, it's kind of around the Marks and Spencers around, it's not just a tomato, it's this. But um, if you ever see the home base advert, for me that's perfect social value because it's around paint. So it's your regular things. Yes, you're getting a tin of paint, but what else is it creating? It's a lovely room where you're going to have lasting memories. I think one of them is about um, an outdoor bench or something and a guy, a, a young lad comes home after a night out. So it's not just a bench, it's actually his comfort zone after he's had a few drinks. Um, so if anybody sees that, have a look at it because that for me, that's that's a perfect example. Thanks so much. I guess um, the one example for me, David, that comes to mind was actually the first call that I referenced uh, the day after we announced we have a new social value support service. And it was this um, 
a national faci- facilities management company. We're looking to bid on, I won't mention their name for confidentiality, but bidding on a £6 million contract here in Bristol. Now, they came to us to ask, do we know any social enterprises locally that they can work with? And one of the, the levers which we've touched on about the Act that I think is very powerful is that lever for collaboration. If it wasn't for this tick box exercise that they're now thinking about how can I score some of that 10% in the procurement process, they wouldn't have reached out to me and they wouldn't have wanted me to introduce them to a social enterprise into their supply chain. Now, they wouldn't have had the incentive to do so. They would have otherwise contracted a private contractor and carried on. Because of the Act and the policy now, there's a, an incentive, there is a lever, there's almost a bit of a stick to sort of encourage organisations to genuinely collaborate bring social sector organisations into supply chains, which I think, as we know, working with lots of social organisations struggling in their own sustainability, could be transformational. So we'll, it's still early days, but we'll see how that unfolds. I, I have to mention on the note around um, is, the, is the actress a bona fide thing? Bristol City Council sadly couldn't be with us today, but they did issue me a statement to share with you. Uh, and there's a, a couple of things on the statement which is particularly pertinent in response to your question. Firstly, to thank everybody involved uh, and to let you know that uh, they've been very supportive about engagement. But there's a couple of particular things that I think are really relevant in response. One is the, um, the Bristol City Council will be undertaking positive action in respect of organisations as and for equalities groups. So they've taken the initiative in the council to focus on identified priority organisations as uh, micro and small enterprises representing or majority leadership um, from diversity groups and the voluntary and community sector. So they are, they are committing themselves, essentially, to identifying those groups as priority to include in some slice of that £330 million worth of procurement. And I guess as a, a big supporter of the sector for a long time, it's probably about the best we can hope for at this stage. So again, early days, and uh, we'll see how things unfold, really. Um, any more questions? Wonderful. Nadia, uh, well, I think we'll take a, a few again. Well, it's mostly because it goes to a live stream. For those of us at home listening or in the work listening, wherever you might be. Uh, I'm Catherine from uh, a big law firm from Sunday, but some of my consultancy managers, so I wonder whether I should change my title. Say <laughs> 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 so there, yeah. Um, so, actually, really inspiring thing that I've heard this afternoon. How do you quantify things, you know, social impact? Um, so we're looking at the London benchmark and all that, so we do, uh, all, all things we do, but we do quite a lot. And 56% of the people are engaged in the community, so every other person we talk to now for all the ages, they've done in the community. But, so I think it's probably also about being realistic, what you measure. So things we do around education, we can measure the world as work experience, which is really quite so we can see, okay, how is it? Doing a garden, yes, it's, it's not a huge skill development, getting boys to, to dig up a garden. But actually, uh, it wasn't the care of the work one lady had to take down for the first time in years because the garden had to be done. Well, that just brings me yeah. up to my, you know, to, to me, and then how do you measure that? How can I say it? So I think it's, it's, it's a balance, and I think what you said is really interesting. There's not one way of measuring social value, but I'd be really interested in finding out how mm-hmm. best. Thanks for the question. It almost goes back to the title of the event. How do we measure and communicate? So, thanks ever so much. Can we take another go- couple of questions whilst we're um, up at the back there? Hello.
Right. So, a bit of a take on the beyond CSR question. Was there a third question in the audience? One at the front here. <laughs> Throw it into the mix. Hi there. So, uh, my name's Claire. I work for the Furniture Reuse Network. Um, and I so just give you a small bit of background for the network of charities that do furniture reuse. Um, and one side of um, the job that I do actually is managing contracts with people like IKEA, John Lewis, um, and Dixon's Carfo to get access to old customer items. So on, this, you know, on the front of it, it sounds great, but actually, we only had to really recently, particularly with IKEA, have we been able to get these big is to understand their social value of working with us and all the charities that they're working with. So is it an issue of communication? Is it an issue that maybe we've not asked them what's important to you, what you want to see them do? We have reams of data, so we can probably push it somewhere. Mm. Um, so, it's not really so something around the value of partnerships and expressing your... If, well, in terms the, of the value that you bring to the partnership, is that what you're referring to? No, no, the value, the, the difference that they're making Gotcha. Furniture reuse organisations supply people in need with local affordable furniture, quality furniture, potential donations, the working housing associations, etc. It's not even about working with us, it's, even, it's about working with. So, how do you help your partners to communicate the value that they're. <laughs> or, uh, even, no, it's um, <laughs> to buy into it, really, yeah. and shout out about it and use it in their commercials and okay. whatever. Yeah, so another measuring and communicating related question. <clears throat> Um, so, in no particular <coughs> order, I know Richard dying to jump in, so I'm going to pass it straight to you. I know you're going to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of things, really. Um, one of the bits, core things, yeah, sure. actually, regarding uh, Catherine about measuring. So, thinking about change. One of the biggest things at the moment we get hung up on is we've always measured outcomes, and outcomes equals change. You can't measure change, in my opinion because it's very much qualitative. So it's about a feel. And how do you measure a feeling? How do you measure what emotion is? And you can do it in some ways, but are we looking to go one beyond that? And that one stage beyond could be behavior change. It could be psychological change. So I'm feeling better. I'm less stressed. Great. But what we're looking for is that one stage beyond that and saying, okay, what are we doing this? Was a physical change. So actually engaging <coughs> with communities and actually be perhaps even reducing down perhaps stereotypes that, that potential law firms or big firms may have with the community can be an emotional change. So in future they may be more engaging. Or it may be as simple as they've actually started to come together as a community more. So they're starting to behave differently. So actually it's reducing barriers all of which has a value, but it's not necessarily a financial value straight away. It's only when that relationship starts to form to doing things differently within a community or doing things differently, differently as an individual can you start to put a, in my opinion, a very defined financial value. So we get sometimes get too hung up on a number at the end, and that's fine. It's no problem. But we've got to think also about the audience. So we know the public sector very much wants you know, cost saving, resource saving. But if we see it as much as what's more important, a appointment in GP's time, so 11.7 minutes I think it is off hand, or the £43 it costs for a GP for that appointment. At the moment we'll say resource, time, because if that appointment isn't needed, the GP is still there. But someone else can take that appointment. So resource becomes more valuable. If we see it as trust and relationships, partnerships, what is that partnership enabling things to happen? Actually, I just wrote down a few things there in terms of, obviously we've got the environmental side. Environmental straight away is not going to landfill. But actually, it's actually helping economics. Because how many people would struggle and try to buy a new piece of furniture, go to high street payday lenders, um, unauthorised um, loans, etc., and take on debt they can't afford? 
But actually, if they can get um, value-based furniture or donated furniture, etc., etc., they're less likely to go down that road. So we tend to get hung up on what we believe is all the direct benefit, but there's so much indirect. So it's about that journey. It's about that stepping stone. And the final thing is about the trust. You can measure trust. Trust is about what it enables you to do. And actually, with everybody today and with every organisation and every community, if you can develop a stronger, more robust, trusted relationship, it becomes a conduit. And that conduit enables you to improve outputs, outcomes, impact, and ultimately value. And the final thing I'll say is, don't always worry about evaluating. Forecast what that is first, but ask people what they want to see. And then you can translate it in a language that they understand, and then use it as you see fit. And if it is for altruistic purposes, if it is for profit-related purposes, does it really matter if there is an ultimate benefit to stakeholders, to community and to society as a whole, as long as you're very clear? And that's where the ethics come in. Interesting. I'm going to have to explain that to Nick, only because uh, one of those questions was directed straight to you, fella. So. Okay, so CSR versus CSV. So, and, and for both of you, the problem with CSR today for the thought leaders in this space is that corporate social responsibility doesn't do justice to what business needs to do today. It's more than a responsibility. It's an obligation. And actually, in a world where we have finite resources, business has to lead the way. And for many of the late majority that are catching up and are now getting into what they're calling CSR, they're still approaching it with the tick box mentality that the thought leaders had 10 years ago. So for some people, CSR means let's go and do a couple of projects, let's tell those stories in our annual report, and then we tick the box that is CSR. To really make it work today, you've got to get rid of the department, the function, you've got to break down the silos, and you've got to systemically put the creation of shared value into the whole business. So that's into HR, that's back through your supply chain. It's looking at how you incentivize your staff and actually incentivizing them around the environment and creating shared value rather than just profit performance. So systemically, you've got to, you've got to break down the silo. And interestingly, there are a number of um, people that I suppose have been in the CSR space for a long time, over 10 years, that are actually expecting to do themselves out of a job suit because they're getting to a place where it is becoming systemic and they're pushing it back through the organisation. So that's why there's, a, a, I suppose, a drive to try and kill off CSR. We've got to move beyond it and got to go to something bigger and that's more systemic. Um, Catherine, to um, some other points that you made, um, and talking a little bit about measurement and SROI, social return on investment. Um, for the big companies, they do now need the number because they have an opportunity to really scale up what they do, to really have huge impact if they can get a number. And so we as Nobody, for example, are looking at measuring in real time activities that happen within the platform. We can use social listening tools to give a score to one project versus another project based on the number of supporters it has or how long it's been in existence across the web. We can measure the number of engagements on a daily basis. We can start to upweight certain people who are really active on the platform versus somebody who's new and create a really granular score for what any project is doing in real time. We can call it the Navy score. And we can look at the Navy effect as well. What's the gravity of bringing more projects and more companies in? So we can get to a point where we're getting increasingly sophisticated data. We can even now track the sentiment of a film using software. So we can get a score based on what the film is conveying using software. It's fascinating what technology can do for you. So that's the direction we need to go in because um, you shouldn't measure everything. I completely agree with Richard because you'll fall down a hole sometimes. However, if you can get a score that you trust, you can really go to scale. And just back to your question on, on furniture, one of the things that we do with Navy at the moment is we connect food surplus, which has been hugely powerful for us because it's just an area 
of society that fundamentally needs addressing. We can use the same technology, we just run it backwards so that a company says, this is, this is what we have, and a community project will say, well, we'll take it off you. We intend to do it for furniture, for anything else that a company would rather give away than chuck away. And for them, they have the appetite to do more, but they're moving so fast to try and work out how to, A, get all this stuff done, B, track it, Certainly when there are legal and, and safety implications, certainly around food, there has to be traceability. So they're just trying to find systems and ways to build it into, the, into their workflow without breaking the business. For many of these organizations, they've got to turn the super tanker and they can't afford to drop the ball on profitability. They've got to do these things in an organized way and, and it just takes time. Mm. Thank you. Um, so yeah, again, to... Um uh, to Catherine, so I won't I won't um, repeat what um, what's already been said, but um, your um, your example about the about building a, a garden was that was that the example that you used creating a garden. So in a sense, yeah, that's one of those kinds of things that that I find in my in my job as well. It, it can be something that's actually quite it is hard to quantify. If you're talking about output, it's just one garden, but what's the, what's the social impact of building that one garden? And I think what you have to do next is start thinking about outcomes and impacts by looking at the difference that that garden's made to the to the people's lives who who use it, and that's that's where the real um, the real story starts to be starts to be told. And like I said before. A story is a really good way to to present social impact. It can be some of the most kind of powerful, um, meaningful things that can stick in somebody's mind a lot better than a than a statistic or a, or a financial proxy value. So you know, don't just um, stop there. But you know, it's something that can be really imp important and, and powerful. And often you'll find it's those case studies as well that, that get picked up by your communications department or something, and they, and they, and they roll with it, and it's over all over sort of social media and that, that kind of thing so it is really important actually um, but there are also ways as well of putting measures on something like a garden so for example you could think about the amount of people that are using that garden and also what do they get out of having a garden um, from my um, experience this thing depending on what it's used for but there's there's the well-being values of increased well-being of people being able to use a safe outside space um, that they enjoy. They can also socialise with other other people that are using the garden as well. If they're, if they're actually doing gardening, there's the, the impact on their on their actual um, health as well. And also, quite often, they might be producing um, fresh, high produce, organic food as well. And learning about healthy foods and that type of thing. Um, and although, so that you're starting to talk about. Um, probably proxy values there as well which um, if you do look online there's there's lots of resources for proxy values there's um, good ones um, uh, the, the hacked is one charity that provides some proxy values um, you know they are just a they are a number in some sense they provide you with a, a monetary value but they can tell you actually that there is a significant association between certain things and increases in well-being so that's that is one way of doing it um, and also there's another one which I've used which you might want to check out is the Global Value Exchange which I found really useful it's lots of um, proxy values and financial um, values from um, different um, impact studies and, and um, research from all over the world I think so yeah I'll try that mm. thanks ever so much Paul um, just really quickly there's two points that I wrote down um, one of the SROI principles is to value and measure what matters so when I um, realised that and really sort of grappled with that, I think I caught about half of my um, the information and data that I collect because I looked at it and thought, do I really need this? What do I do with this? Who, who cares about this information? And if no one cares or it's not going to direct your business any better or um, create better services, don't bother. Just, just get rid of it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, really just, just, just measure what matters. Um, and then the other thing was just to echo case studies, really. So um, we use case studies a, a lot, especially in, from tendering and also to, uh, we have a lot of, not CSR, um, partners. And I will provide them with case studies. So, um, for example, if they, I don't know, furniture or something, where's that furniture gone? Um, what, what's the story behind it? Has it gone to a family? 
what does that mean to a family? Does it mean they can sit around the table and all eat together? Does it mean it saved them money that they couldn't afford? Blah, blah, blah. Um, adding that real uh, personal touch and giving that to organisations, I've found has really been useful and it plays on their emotions, obviously. They can then use that. Um, we had a, um, a shop called More Than Vintage for a while. It was a vintage clothing charity shop. And it came out of um, a woman donated loads of clothes and what she did, it, they were really, really old clothes and what she did is she put a little um, message in all of them. So I think one of them she wore to like a fancy dinner with some really famous people or something and all of her clothes sold really well because we sold the story. Um, so people buy into that as well. So then we started doing that with a lot of our clothes when they came in and we could actually get the donor from the donor we said where's this come from uh, is, have you got any nice stories along with it and so we sold the story and that really helped um, and then people <coughs> appreciate that as well of course so just the stories and just to your garden example and to show you where this can go so uh, we make films of our projects we select projects and send a filmmaker out to try and capture those moments because they're hugely valuable um, when we really realised we were onto something was when we sent our filmmaker Ryan out to go to a community cafe that Marks and Spencers had put £300 into. But the story was so compelling that they sent it round to all of their staff and then it, I think it's still their intention to, to put the, the film in all of their community cafes to show the sorts of things that they're doing. We had another one where um, Joanna Lumley went up to Edinburgh to deliver a food parcel to a charity as a surprise. And Marks and Spencers put this on their Facebook page with just a tiny little paid media nudge, really small amount of money. 1.1 million views, 13,000 likes, two and a half thousand comments, overridingly positive. So suddenly the marketing department goes, wow, this is even better than David Gandhi and his underpants. Even he can't get those sorts of numbers. So then they sent out a member of staff from back of store to go and experience the same, to see if they could measure the, the Joanna Lumley effect. And they showed again that, that actually it was really great content. Anyone can make a film. So if you as a project, with your camera phone, film and capture that moment of engagement, and somebody puts that up across social media or onto the neighbourhood platform where it gets shared, that just means that business will think, actually there's value there, let's do more of this. My personal ambition as an ex-advertising guy is to move underperforming advertising spend out of those channels into doing good and genuine impact because actually those stories and the distribution of those stories has real value. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. I, I guess the only thing to I was thinking about adding as um, there's, there's very little other than the, the power um, of uh, qualitative storytelling and, uh, and conveying content. Uh, I suppose it's also thinking about your audience because typically when you're producing uh, a report or a forecast or you're looking to communicate the measurement of the impact that you're having, I guess it's factoring in who you're looking to communicate that with. Is that for a funder? Is that for um, uh, your general audience? Is that for your beneficiaries, customers, etc.? And yes, you may wish to present something that speaks to everybody, uh, but I guess it's worth considering who you're looking to communicate with um, to factor into what it is that you want to communicate with, I suppose. Um, I appreciate we're uh, almost running out of steam a little bit. I was just wondering whether there are any sort of final questions. We do a final round of questions. Yes, let's do that. Up at the back and then we'll come to you in the front. Here. It's really rubbish. You're going to talk a bit louder, sorry. Really rude and not very meaningful. So I'm kind of wondering whether anyone has any ideas. 
I'm sure they certainly do. I, I probably worth mentioning. You sat next to a funder, and the microphone's about to go down to another one in a moment. So um, I guess we'll hopefully get some uh, inside feedback from the funders' perspective for you later. Uh, I'm sure the panel could consider that one. Um, <coughs> kind of teed you up a little, uh, a little nicely there, Tim. Perhaps. Do you want to respond to that one in particular, Martin? <laughs> um, I don't know if I have an instant response, but I'll try to. I'll try to give it some thought. I, I'm Tim Temple from the big lottery firms, and, and I'm. What I'm using is some of the some of the things that I see when I see and read applications, and I'm just listening to um, some of the interaction about the elegant currencies, the offering people offering time, um, and I'm wondering there is some you, know, you, you were saying you work for a law firm. There are some um, real skills here, and some of the offers, the, the ones that are easy to grasp, are the many hands type of things. Now, a couple of things about that. When I, when Margaret and I have been at one or two events, some of those take a huge amount of time and effort to set up. So, monetizing that, who pays for that, does it actually have value? How do you offset some of that? That's one. The other is um, the trade of those skills. The skills that people have got is something that I'd be really interested in, particularly as we're seeing less infrastructure provided by um, local authority budgets, and it's still there, it's there in different shapes and forms, but there are people in this room, there are people for whom this is attractive, mm. that I think you really have more to offer than just the eight hours a day or whatever it is, it's some, something that you perhaps don't realise. Uh, and what we see is some of that isn't just, uh, it's easy to say accountants, accountants and lawyers, but there are other skills that people within businesses offer as well. And there's not actually a question there, but there's a something there, yeah. <laughs> there's a something of an answer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Was there um, another question down at the front here? Thanks ever so much. <coughs> so this is back to the first question of this, this round. Um, I would also work for a very small turnover of less than 200,000. Um, and we work with very vulnerable people as well, and we've had uh, strokes and being left with long-term difficulties and disabilities. Um, I suppose my question is really what's in it for us? Uh, I did sign up for Maple Leaf uh, not long after it launched uh, because we had been charity of the year for Marks and Spencer's last year, so I was looking to follow that up. Um, I thought that was a good no response. Um, maybe that's just I'm starting to understand maybe I'm not using it right. Um, but that's quite fun. But I'm kind of wondering what is in it for charities like us who work with people, um, working with people. Sort of mean. We don't uh, we don't work with materials, we don't work in the environment, we don't specifically add any value to the wider community except in the fact that we work, you know, we help people to get better. Mm. Um, and is that an intrinsic? Can we work on our or promote our intrinsic values? Is what I'm Thanks ever so much, and that's a good question. What's what is it? In it? What's in it for us? And particularly, like you say, charities and social enterprise organisation, it, its int value is intrinsic to their DNA, essentially. Um, but some some good questions. So measuring intangibles, what's in it for us, and um, something around uh, perhaps going back to the feudal times of, of bartering our trades and skills, and how do we unlock the talents of people? Uh, I think there's some uh, a range of topics to delve into. Anybody want to take the first uh, response? <laughs> Thought you were going. <laughs> um, there's no one straight answer like anything is, unfortunately. However, there's a few bits. Um, the whole thing about round befriending, there's actually two aspects. Firstly, it's actually the value the volunteer themselves get out of it. So, if you think of that emotional, psychological, physical that um, change in, and the experiences that they're finding. So the fact that person's getting out, the fact they're actually being more engaging, they're developing a peer network, they're actually reducing down the, perhaps some, some social barriers and some preconceptions that they may have had over time. So there's an aspect there, so it's a health and well-being, particularly well-being aspect. Also actually linking around to actually the fact that person's donating that time to support the individual. What is the actual financial value of that? So what would the public sector have to spend to get the same benefit. So the way I would approach that very simply is saying, okay, what would be the cost of somebody coming to that person and spending an hour with them? And you could do that very simply by going online to say, okay, if I was to employ 
a person for an hour or two hours, what would be the cost? Because volunteering, the direct volunteering cost, isn't about minimum living wage, it isn't about minimum wage, it's about the value of the role they do. Okay? Then in terms of the actual, um, the, the, the other aspect, in terms of the recipient, okay, well, as a result of actually being able to potentially develop um, language skills and being able to engage more, how is that affecting them? So it's actually asking them, that, that, them two questions. What is changing for you as a result of this person coming in and having that conversation? And are you able to do anything different both now or are you planning to do things different in the future? Because it's that difference which you can start to monetize. But it may just be, I have less fear. I have reduced my anticipation. I am no longer stressed. I am no longer um, sitting at home. I may actually be considering volunteering myself, which happens quite often. Um, in respect of actually some of the skill trade, actually there's a core aspect around time banking. And actually thinking about how many people could share their, their, their trade and apply their trade. Particularly around individuals and organisations who otherwise couldn't access that support. Um, there's actually quite a, a number of case studies around time banking which you can get online, both from a financial and non-financial. But effectively, what is the value of time? Well actually, how much would you have to pay for that person to come in and support you in the first place? So you can actually get a financial prospect uh, there. Um, the other aspect is around the, the, the spoke sign. Actually, I would say, yes, it's about that person being able to be coming back into the community, starting to participate more, becoming active. But actually, what is the value of doing that? Well, it actually it generally means that professional services, um, NHS, social care, mental health teams potentially don't have to engage quite as often. So actually, as long as we know, and that would actually involve speaking to those individual stakeholders to say what was support that would you provide <coughs> both prior to and after that stroke unfortunately occurring. And as a result of a volunteer or a person being there for my organisation, has there been a change or a reduction? probably will say yes or they could be. So then you just work out from a financial point of view what is the value of that person coming in. So that could be uh, a mental health um, um, hourly rate could be something around £75 an hour. A befriender there are some things around £9 an hour. There are things around actually less domiciliary care support. How much is domiciliary care? anywhere between 13 50 and about £15.50 per visit. So you can start to calculate that happening. So probably the key thing would be what isn't happening as a result of your charity and that's where the value would be. Very quick. Yeah, I'm just going to slide it there. Yeah, mine was really just quite similar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a lot of care homes, so a lot of our, some of our customers, um, they've got absolutely no capacity at all. So how do I measure that value that there's change there? Um, so what I did in one case was um, consult with the care staff. So, okay, they're having less tantrums. Our customers seem to be smiling more. I mean, these are all things that are still measurable because they, they, they know the customers well enough. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to have a figure on it because something like that, how you, okay, you can put a figure on it in some cases, but if you could say, okay, well, this week we've had four tantrums as opposed to 24, um, or four people throwing things at me or whatever, that's still really effective and people still really um, understand that as a, as a measure. So you can measure everything, but it's just finding a way of how to do it. And often measuring what hasn't happened as opposed to what ha has happened is, is just as valuable. Um, and the other thing was around skills sharing. Um, one thing that I've done uh, within the charity, because obviously there's one of me, we've got 800 staff, um, I couldn't go around and teach all of my staff about social value. So um, what I did was create a, a working group so that I had, um, this might be useful for the bigger organisations, so that I had a representative within all of the services to um, talk about it, to champion it. 
So that was just one thing. And the other thing is, as part of our own social value, um, I get in touch with smaller local organisations to ask if they need support around social value, if they need my help in any way. Um, and that's been really useful. So I'm sort of sharing my skills, but I'm also hitting my own outcome, if that helps. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't really have much to add to um, to those responses. Really, I think <clears throat> the area that I probably would have um, um, looked at would yeah would be would have been your problem that you're having, Sam. But um, yeah, I think Rich Rich came up with some really good examples of things that you could do actually. Um, Sorry, just steal your thunder a little bit there. Yeah. Rich, oh, your thunder, thought, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. But I mean, there, there's certain ways of, of doing things, and it's you know that's yeah, Rich is some of the best and right ways of doing it really. Um, I think, you know, when, when you've got you've got the perfect opportunity though, I think as well, to really kind of tell a story right from a, a, right from the start. So how, and I think Rich touched on this as well, right from the start and then right at the end. And it, you know, there's, there's lots of ways of, of doing that, but by having that start and, you know, not even an end point, but a certain amount of time down the year, that's a really good opportunity to be able to show the, you know, a start point end to a cause and effect, basically, what's, what's the difference that has been made, so. Yeah, you've got good, uh, the opportunities there, I think. Mm. So I'm going to start with Tim's question. We have to move to skills-based volunteering because it's a requirement of most of the bigger organisations who have got to a place where they're saying, this is an effective use of, of our time and resource and most importantly expertise. And people who have those qualifications and capabilities don't particularly want to paint a fence. They want to use those capabilities. Um, with Enabling, when you volunteer, we've at the moment got a dialogue box, so you can say what your special skill is, but we're going to move to tick boxes so that you can really properly, from a data perspective, see who is capable of giving what. And that leads nicely to Sam, really, because Sam, what you really need is a volunteer from a professional service industry who can come and tackle your problem. And you can say, I need a volunteer to help me measure this, because I, I don't have the bandwidth, I've not done it before, um, I don't have... Um, I don't have the resources to pay for somebody to do this. I need a volunteer. Now, actually, for some professional services firms, that might be a brilliant place for somebody to go and use one of their three days and maybe to build a relationship with you to say, actually, I really want to carry on helping. Um, and to back to Emma, so from a perspective of um, what you've done on Neighbourly and what do you get out of it, there's a couple of things to say there. Um, I'm almost loathed at this point in proceedings to introduce the global goals, but they need to be in here. We need to be talking about it. The UK, along with 194 countries in the world, have committed to ending poverty by 2030. And in order to do that, there has to be a really collaborative, combined effort by business, by government, local councils, and people to try and work together to move the dial. And one of the, I suppose, the overriding ways of measuring the 17 goals is the simple happiness and well-being measure. Now, for everything that you're doing, you're contributing in your way to the happiness and the well-being of your community. And increasingly that will be recognised by local councils and by businesses who need to show that they're supporting organisations that are making that difference. And they need to show it because they've got to be able to report back on how they're impacting on the global goals. So I think there is definite momentum towards increasingly recognising what you're doing and coming to prop you up and support you. With regards to Nabley, I'm really pleased that you've had a go and, and um, you'd like to see more happen. For us, we're starting to grow now. We're getting to a point where we're getting more money, more volunteering, starting to have that gravity and of course more that comes in, then there's more opportunity for projects to receive. There is a little bit of it, whatever you put in you get out it's that same old thing as with anything in life what you're basically doing is asking a company um, to move money and if they're going to move that money from perhaps paying for advertising to engage people what is it about you that creates a story have you got a huge number of followers are you really active and do you use platforms like maybe and others to say thank you and that requires work and, and you know and it does require a little bit of digital upskilling but actually those that do it best and actually create the most noise are the ones that really show show up they float to the top 
So it is a little bit of what you put in. But at the same time, any company can say, I don't actually care about the noise, I just want to know that we're having an impact and where there's a really clear fit, we'll just go and do that thing. So there's a bit of both in there. Mm. Um, Nick, thanks for that. I think we started off very locally and we were sort of ended up a bit more globally. So that's been a, a nice uh, and insightful journey. And we were approaching rapidly the end of the session. I wanted to leave some time for the end to do uh, for you guys to sort of network and get to speak to each other uh, in an informal way, really. Um, so just a few things to uh, to mention. Um, one is that this is the first of hopefully a series of events. We wanted to keep this one nice and broad and open, uh, but we are hoping to uh, have more thematic events in future. I'm going to ask all of you, you've got some feedback forms on your chairs. Uh, it'd be great to get your feedback if you could take a few minutes to do so before you leave. Um, the other thing is just a plug for myself. Um, social Enterprise Works has launched a support service helping people forecast and evaluate your social value. So if this is something you're struggling with, please do seek us out and we'd be more than happy to help. Um, but finally, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, all of our speakers and contributors today. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for showing up and giving your time to be with us today. I wanted to thank anybody who might be watching uh, uh, from wherever you might be. Um, and that's the wrap, really. Uh, thanks ever so much. See you next time. Cheers.